Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in that hanging tree. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Everybody has heard of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Hairy Man, etc. The Loch Ness Monster has his own fan club for years. There are some cryptids that are well known in their own neck of the woods, but few folks outside of the immediate area have heard of them. Here are a few monsters seen by the locals, but seldom mentioned on TV. The Ozarks cover a vast section of the United States in Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and a very tiny corner of southeastern Kansas. I've been there many years ago, and I'd like to go back. Having heard all manner of strange things going on in these mountains, I'd love to spend a week and see what I could track down. One creature, seen by few but heard by many, is called the Ozark Howler. This creature is described as being a very dark or black cat, with strong legs, powerful shoulders, long claws, in very long teeth. Those who see it say it has a tail that kind of reminds them of a raccoon, sometimes with gray rings mixed in with the black fur. Some folks describe the howler as looking like an overgrown lynx. Others say it looks like a mountain lion, only it's all black. There are no black mountain lions. They don't have the melanistic gene to produce black fur. Now, I know people who have seen black mountain lions. They have photos of them. This must be some other cat species. Maybe the jaguarundi or the jaguar. Whatever these folks saw, it wasn't an Ozark howler because one feature they have that no other cat has is horns. The Ozark Howler comes equipped with a set of antlers that look more like something you'd see on a deer. A horned cat is just too many weapons. Claws, teeth, and horns. Those headbutts my cats like would be very painful. The other thing the Howler has is its voice. Those who have heard the howler say it's a blood-curdling sound that makes them wish they were someplace else. The howl can be heard for miles, and it sounds like a cross between a wolf, a mountain lion, and a coyote. The howler also comes equipped with a mouthful of sharp fangs. Some have reported these teeth as being long, like a saber-toothed tiger. The boys in the white lab coats all say saber-toothed tigers went extinct 10,000 years ago. They'll haul out the old fossil record and say no saber-toothed tiger has been found since that date. Being members of the cat family, they could have been smart enough to avoid ending up in places where fossils can be formed. The conditions have to be right for a fossil to come about. Yeah, there's no sense arguing with folks who have their minds made up on everything. Those who have seen the howler say 
it can get twice as big as a mountain lion. Now, a mountain lion can get up to 200 pounds, so the howler could weigh in at 400 pounds. The howler is apparently migratory, but at certain times of the year it'll settle in to an area and claim it as its own. It leaves territory marking signs such as claw raking on trees, uh, prey remains, large cat-like teeth marks, and on occasion, tracks. The remains of its prey can be found high up in trees, hidden under bushes, between rocks, or even in caves. <clears throat> because of its description, uh, signs, and behavior, it resembles a panther. Many believe the Ozark Howler is simply just a huge unidentified panther or perhaps a living ancient relic American cat not found in the records. Uh, kind of like a saber-toothed tiger that's still alive. Panthers don't make the sounds heard when the Ozark Howler is out hunting or looking for its mate. These screams and howls can be heard for miles. To add to the mystery, the creature has left behind evidence of walking on two legs. Tracks have been found as showing something moving around the mountains that is traveling on two feet like a man or a Bigfoot. The howler doesn't travel far on two feet, but there aren't many cats that can walk hundreds of feet using only its hind legs. Uh, seeing as the howler has been around for at least a hundred years, there are some weird reports out there. A few said the creature had no head. Uh, this could be due to seeing it at an odd angle, or maybe its head was tucked down low to the ground following a scent trail. The first recorded sighting of the howler uh, came in the 19th century with the legendary frontiersman Daniel Boone, even describing a possible encounter with the creature in his letter to his sister-in-law, written in 1810. He said, I leave you with an alarming story of a black creature I found and wounded on the Sutter Creek black and swarthy with horns on its scalp. Ignorant of its name, I am told of the sound it makes with a terrible howl in the night. Warnings of this for settlers should be passed along. Your humble servant, a Daniel Boone. Even stranger, there are stories of Boone encountering the howl, howler about six years later. Uh, this time, he said he killed it. A 1927 report was written by a college student who had gone for a walk in the woods. Here's what he had to say. I was on a thin road, barely wider than a footpath, completely surrounded by dark forest when suddenly a large dark figure jumped across the road in front of me. I was alarmed, to say the least, and immediately stood still to consider what I had seen, wondering if I should investigate. Stepping forward slowly, I looked around the side of the road for any sight of movement or sound. As my eyes were adjusting to the dark, I thought I could see a large, looming figure atop a rise around what I estimated to be a few yards from where I stood. I didn't know what to make of it, seeing only the still outline of the silhouette. I noticed it slowly moving towards me, which gave me enough reason to hurry forward on my way. I knew that I still had about two miles to go before the nearest neighbor who might let me in. Before I began walking again, I lit my lantern so that I could see the way more clearly. That's what I told myself, anyway. I think I just felt better with a light, as if the brightness would protect me from the creatures in the darkness. I began to see more clearly at the edge of the warm light what I could only describe as a somewhat feline face. 
but with dark and long shaggy hair, as well as large yellow eyes that were focused on me. Without thinking why, I thrust my lantern out in front of me before the creature could get any closer. With my heart beating fast, I began walking down the road again as fast as I could. It followed. I am sure of that, but the beast never attacked. The last I saw of it was when I pressed on the gas with a blur, followed by a guttural howl as I quickly put distance between us. I'm guessing when he said he pressed on the gas, he was being idiomatic, as in, since he was walking, he didn't have a gas pedal to push on. After returning from combat in World War II, the soldiers began building new housing to raise their families. The United States was booming. The country was in better shape than any other country on the planet. Those who chose to build in the Ozarks found something other than the Nazis to worry about. The people were living in parts of the mountains never visited until then. As folks began to move farther into the wilderness, they began hearing and seeing the howler. People didn't talk about it. Only crazy people heard or saw things like giant black cats with horns. Eventually, around the 1950s, a story was ran in the local paper. This led to more reports coming out about the creature. In the early 1980s, a long-haul trucker reported seeing the howler after pulling off the road. His story is referred to in many accounts, but the story itself is missing. <clears throat> the Ozark Howler would again be in the media in the 2000s, when numerous sightings sprang up in addition to a family repeatedly seeing the beast as well as capturing it on a trail cam. The image looks like some kind of a cat creature leaned up against a tree. The man who caught the image went and stood next to the tree, and it looks as if the thing was about six feet tall. The couple also caught the creature on audio recording. The Ozark Howler was spotted on July 27, 2018, on the Full Moon Trail in the Marguerite Bray Conservation Area near Newburgh and Rolla, Missouri. Walking the trail with flashlights after dark, Terry Shrout and Dean Grain spotted something in the trees. Shrout first noticed the Ozark Howler as a black silhouette by the side of the trail. When I first looked, it was low to the ground, and I saw it rise up. I froze completely. I was scared because I didn't know what it was. It was probably at least six feet tall. It looked very much like a bear, but it moved like a cat. It was graceful. It didn't make any noise. It was like it just disappeared. A grain reported, This thing was huge. It leapt up the ridge line at least 15 to 20 feet before it hit the ground and took off. We didn't see it anymore. We could hear the footfalls just a few steps through the leaves. I was floored by what it was. I mean, there's no one seeing something like this, and once you see it, oh, there's no denying it. <clears throat> A bunch of photos were put on Facebook reportedly of the Ozark Howler. The local game warden said, these must be fakes. Well, the photographer reached out to him and showed him dozens of other photos that soon convinced the warden the images were legitimate. The creature in the photos looks like a small deer with a long, thin tail. It was dark furred, but not black. Every report of the howler said the thing was enormous and black. The creature in the photos could be some other unknown creature, or perhaps it could be just a young howler. The naysayers will always talk about how a body has never been found.
Well, we don't know if a body may have been seen yesterday. If you're out walking in the woods and you find a dead animal, you're not likely to go looking at it. The smell alone will get you to back off. Other animals will find this an easy meal, and the remains would soon become someone's dinner scattered far and wide. Lorne Coleman, the famous and respected cryptozoologist, said, Specifically, I've never seen a cryptid when I've gone looking for one, even though I've been on expeditions for 50 years. I've found many tracks, I've heard many screeches and unknown sounds. I've interviewed hundreds of witnesses. In 1972, I saw a black panther in southern Illinois when I was in a car coming from work, and none of the people in the car would turn around. I was put in a situation of being an eyewitness where I could not go and further investigate the black panther report. The Ozarks region does extend into southern Illinois. The Ozark Howler might be one and only cryptid Mr. Coleman has ever seen. I've mentioned running into Lauren Coleman in an elevator in Tyler, Texas. A super nice guy. He took me around and introduced me to all the other speakers at the conference as if I was his longtime friend. We'd known each other for two minutes. The Inkanyaba or Inkanyamba, are said to be a population of large migratory carnivorous eels, which are indigenous to southern Africa. The most talked about of these creatures is said to dwell in the deep pools beneath South Africa's legendary Howick Falls, which are known to the Zulu as Kwanagwaza, or the Tall One. Howick Falls are in South Africa where, surprisingly, I have a few listeners. After compared, often compared to the savage eel-like animals said to dwell in Newfoundland's Crescent Lake, these creatures have been described as being a colossal eel-like anomaly with thinned mane, huge foreflippers, a horse-like head, and a very nasty disposition. Judging from this description, it's no wonder that the Inkanyamba have inspired both awe and terror throughout the Zulu and the Zosa communities for centuries. The one thing that makes these creatures really unsettling is some folks say they can fly. A giant winged eel, just one more reason to hide under the bed where the other monsters live. Accounts of these animals date back to aboriginal cave paintings found throughout the KwaZulu-Natal area. These paintings be depict creatures which archaeologists have come to refer to as rain animals uh, due to their association with vicious summer storms. Believed by most investigators to be a large species of freshwater eel, uh, such as the Angula Mozambica or the Angula Mormorata, uh, both of which can grow to about six feet long, the natives of the area insist the Incanyamba are much larger and bear some supernatural characteristics, things like being able to fly. As recently as 1998, residents of the Inguavuma and Pongola regions of KwaZulu-Natal blamed the violent Inkamyamba for a brutal storm in which thousands of peoples lo people lost their homes. There's no such thing as peoples. It's like fishes and monies. There are certain words you don't pluralize. It's people, it's money, it's fish. But some people like to throw an S on the end of everything. The ancient connection between the Inkanyamba and several meteorological events is due to the fact that the animal is rarely seen during the summer months. 
According to traditional Zosa beliefs, the Incanyamba takes to the sky annually in the form of a giant tornado in order to find its mate. The absence of the Incanyamba during the summer months is indicative of the long-held Zulu assumption that these creatures are migratory in nature. In fact, these animals have been seen in the Mkosmai, yeah, uh, African word, Mkosmai River, which is about 44 miles south of the Hawk Falls, as well as in the water pooled around the Midmar Dam, an area which covers approximately 500 square miles. There have also been eyewitness reports hailing from smaller dams near farms in the Dargal area of the Midlands. There have been occasional reports of two Incanyamba engaged in vicious aquatic battles over what just might be an issue of territorial supremacy. Then again, the two creatures just might be in the throes of their mating ritual. In 1996, a newspaper offered a reward for anyone who could produce photographic evidence of the creatures. Two photographs were published. Neither one gave any clear indications of the animal's appearance, and they were accused of both being hoaxes. The knee-jerk reaction of most newspapers and talking heads to call any evidence fake has led to more than one person keeping their sightings and photographs to themselves. Most people will avoid being ridiculed, especially on TV or in the news. The images that were published did get some witnesses to come forward and tell their stories, but it also got the nasty, noisy, negative naysayers to come out in force. Their self-righteous mantra of, I don't believe it, so it must be fake, is getting really old and weak. If some of these folks would spend half as much time actually looking at the evidence, they might just change their minds. A year later, in a region not far from Howick, known as the St. Lava River, a similar controversy raged regarding another large aquatic predator. Locals there said they were under siege by a huge crocodilian creature with a long neck and a skull-piercing proboscis, dubbed the African Brain Sucker, or in the native tongue, Mamblambo. The Mamblambo is a giant aquatic creature with green eyes. Witnesses have said this animal has two gleaming green eyes which possess the power to mesmerize anybody unfortunate, <coughs> excuse me, unfortunate enough to make eye contact with the beast. It then drags you under and eats your face as it burrows in to get to your brain. How delightful. In May 1996, the rumor that the South African government was planning on capturing the Inca Mnyamba that lurked beneath Howick Falls and transplant it into an environmentally protected area. Local Zulus were outraged by this plan, partitioning their local council for an intervention. The residents were terrified that the expedition sent to capture the beast might not be prepared to deal with the vicious disposition of the creature and that the resulting carnage might spill over into the local villages. They must know how government actions work out. They set out to do something good and they wind up ruining everything. It's kind of comforting to know that no matter where you go, the government will screw things up. The most recent report indicate that South African government has reconsidered the wisdom of challenging these mighty semi-aquatic beasts on their home turf. Near the mouth of the Altamaha River in southeastern Georgia, uh, the state, not the country, resides a hissing sea monster called Altamaha 
which is named for the river. The locals call it Alti for short. The legend of the river monster predates English colonization and may have originated with the Lower Muskegee Creek tribe. One of the largest rivers in the state of Georgia empties into the Atlantic Ocean and has one of the largest river basins in the country, a second only to the Mississippi. Extending about 137 miles, it joins up with three major tributaries, the Okamugli, the Okani rivers near Lumberton City, and joined further downriver by the Oupi River. It empties out into the Altamaha Sound above Brunswick, where it is joined by the Darien, Butler, and Campagne rivers before making its way out to the ocean. The river area, located primarily in McIntosh and Glen counties along the Atlantic coast, is not comprised of beach, but rather is made up of many islands, acres of marshes, dikes, canals, ponds, and old rice fields, what you would call a river delta. The Altamaha is said to inhabit the myriads of small streams and twisting canals of the river and adjacent marshes, particularly around Darien, Butler Island, and elsewhere in McIntosh County. This strange cryptid is described as having a sturgeon-like body, including a bony ridge on its top. It has front flippers, but no back limbs. It swims like a dolphin and has a snout like a crocodile, with large protruding eyes and very large sharp teeth. Its coloring is said to be gray or green, with a whitish-yellow underbelly. Some say it's a giant snake with front flippers, while others say it's an altogether different beast. Reports indicate that it's between 20 and 30 feet long, though some have reported seeing larger creatures, uh, suggesting that the Altamaha might be a large group of creatures. Uh, folks have seen the creature laying on the riverbank, resting or warming itself in the sun. Anyone brave or foolish enough to approach the Altamaha will be met with a violent and dangerous reaction. Uh, the beast is not friendly. Though no physical evidence of the Altamaha has been found, the tales date back for centuries, with the Indians describing a giant snake-like creature that hisses and bellows. One of the first non-native reports of the creature was from April 18, 1830, when a correspondent from the Savannah Georgian newspaper reported multiple sightings of a sea monster on the Georgia coast. The primary eyewitness was Captain Delano of the schooner Eagle, who reported seeing a large creature off of St. Simon's Island below the mouth of Altamaha River. His description stated that the creature was 70 feet long, its circumference was about the size of a barrel, and its head resembled an alligator. Five other men on the schooner also reported having seen the monster, as well as several people on St. Simon's Island. In the 1920s, Timbermen riding the river reported sightings of a large snake-like water monster. 1935, a group of hunters spotted what they called a giant snake swimming through the river. In the 1940s, Boy Scouts reported seeing the creature as well as two officials from the Reedsville State Prison. 1969, two brothers were fishing on the Altamaha River at Clark's Bluff. They reported seeing an animal that they first thought was a sturgeon, but they quickly changed their minds when they got a better look. Stating that it measured about 10 to 12 feet long, with a snout like an alligator and a horizontal tail. 
They also describe the creature having a triangular ridge along the top of its body, sharp pointy teeth, and being a gunmetal gray color. <clears throat> In the summer of 1980, two men said they saw the Altamaha uh, stranded on a mud bank near Cathead Creek. They reported that the animal was lying halfway in the water, thrashing and trying to free itself from the bank. They described it as being dark colored with rough skin, about 20 feet long. While watching, the creature freed itself, submerged, and disappeared. Later that year, December 1980, another man reported having seen what he thought was the Altamaha in Smith Lake. His description said the animal was 15 to 20 feet long, snake light with two brown humps that protruded from the water. It left behind a wake like that of a speedboat. Another report in the 80s described by a crab fisherman uh, stated the creature looked like the world's biggest eel. A more recent report in 20, uh, 2002 was by a man pulling a boat up the river near Brunswick who reported seeing something over 20 feet in length and 6 feet wide break the water. Uh, 2010, an amateur photographer captured a video of something strange swimming in the channel off Fort King George Historic Site in Darien. We know more about the moon than what might be lurking under the water that covers three-fifths of the earth. People have been reporting the Altamaha for hundreds of years. They can't all be seeing things or making things up. There could be some yet undiscovered monster living in the rivers of Georgia. <clears throat> A Murphy's Burrow, Illinois, at around midnight, 1973, a young couple was parked by a desolate riverside for a romantic interlude. Fill in your own details on that. When they came face to face with a huge, wet, hairy, mud-covered monstrosity. Randy Needham and Judy Johnson were parked at the foot of a 23rd Street in Riverside Park near the town's old boat ramp overlooking the Big Muddy River. Uh, Johnson's father had expressly forbade his daughter from dating Needham, which is why the pair chose such a isolated location for their illicit rendezvous. Now, this kind of puts an end to their evening. Now, talk about a bad date. Now, this will be what all other encounters is measured against. There are those who will immediately say this is just one of those stories used to tell kids they had best listen to their parents and not go messing around. If you think about it, the only way you'll run into creatures that hide from humans is by going to places where nobody goes and doing things that most people don't do. There was a report of a farmer having a run-in with the mud monster long before the area was developed into a town, but there's no record of who he was or what he had said, only that he had seen a thing that looked like it was covered in mud and had white hair. The farm sat where Westwood Hills would be built later on. A Johnson said they were just sitting in Needham's car listening to the radio when they heard a weird sound. It was ear-piercing roar coming from somewhere near the river. Needham said it sounded like an eagle screaming into a microphone. That's an interesting thought. Uh, thinking it might be somebody messing with them, Needham turned the radio off and the couple sat there trying to see who it was. Another horrifying shriek echoed through the night, accompanied by a rattling of the bushes right in front of them. Needham flicked on his headlights and they both saw a huge hair-covered thing. The hair was plastered to its body by a massive amount of mud. 
The creature gave off a foul smell as it began walking towards them. Needham did what most victims in movies don't do. He fired up his vehicle and sped away, putting distance between them and it. It wasn't until they got back into town that the couple tried to figure out what they'd seen. Could it have been real, or were they both seeing things? They also tried to decide should they file a report, which would eventually wind up being heard by her father, who would then be a little bit no, he would be quite upset with her. As should they keep their sighting to themselves and pray nobody else wound up seeing and possibly being killed by this creature? What would you do in a situation like that? They finally decided they had to let the authorities know there was a monster hanging out near the big muddy river. The couple arrived at the station and made out what is known as an unknown creature report, describing a beast that looked like an oversized gorilla, which they estimated to be almost eight feet tall, with matted, mud-streaked white hair. The former patrolman who retired as Murphy Burroughs police chief, Ron Manwaring was still able to recite the facts of this strange incident from memory almost three decades later. The first report came in just before midnight on June 25th. A couple had been parked near the boat dock on the southwest edge of Riverside Park next to the woods. The two, who were not married, uh, said they were in the car when they heard a loud screaming sound in the wooded area and observed a large creature, approximately seven feet tall. The creature appeared to have light-colored hair matted with mud. The creature appeared to be walking on two legs and was proceeding towards their car. A man wearing felt that the couple's account was given credibility due to the fact they risked exposing their indiscretions, which would no doubt bring them public ridicule and even more alarming, uh, Johnson's father's wrath, because they were so frightened by what they'd seen by the river. There was no advantageous reason for them to come up and file a report. While the officers who took down Needham and Johnson's statements were understandably skeptical of the event, they did send out two patrolmen, <clears throat> Merle Lindsay and Jimmy Nash, to investigate. Within minutes of the sighting, the officers arrived at the boat ramp in the Riverside Park area and began looking around. Officer Nash was the first to discover a bunch of peculiar tracks. They were approximately 10 to 12 inches long and 3 inches wide, and deeply impressed into the mud by the riverbank. Nash said he bent over to inspect the prints for a closer vantage point when he heard a horrifying shriek nearby. And Nash was so surprised he bolted for the cruiser, dropping his revolver in his haste. When selecting a holster, you have to decide speed of draw against security of weapon. When we first arrived on duty in Laredo, we were issued holsters that had neither. The holsters were designed to be worn in a dress uniform, so they stuck out to clear the dress jacket. Now this made them catch on everything we had a tendency to run through, like brush and cariso. A plus, the seat belt would always catch in the gap. If you pulled too hard to get away from the things that were trapping you, the holster would come off the belt attachment. Within a few weeks, I had bought a much better, less expensive holster from Kirkpatrick's. The government had paid a lot of money for a piece of junk holster. <laughs> Back to the Big Muddy River. Officer Nash said he initially thought the story was nothing more but a load of hogwash. Then, when he heard that sound, the most incredible shriek I've ever heard. It was in those bushes. It was no bobcat or screech owl. 
We hightailed it out of there. <clears throat> Nash and Lindsay quickly went back to the station to report their findings and gather more men for a search party. The officers later estimated that whatever had made that sharp cry was about 300 feet from them. Approximately two hours later, 2 a.m., June 26th, Officer Nash and Lindsay returned to the scene accompanied by Officer Bob Scott and Randy Needham. It was quite common back then for witnesses to accompany officers to the scene in order to point out what they had seen and where. The four men discovered another set of tracks near the river. As Lindsay ran back to the patrol car to retrieve a camera, the rest of the group began following the prints along the bank. As the three men followed the tracks along the river bank, they heard that same ear-piercing scream. A sound can have an effect on people. It's human nature. Way back when we were still not so well armed, anything big enough to make a huge sound was big enough to make us into a small meal. So, we learned to run fast and think about it later. The three men joined Lindsay back in the patrol unit. Once the four had sat in the car for enough time to settle their nerves, they slipped back out to try finding the, sound, the source of the sounds. They made their way back to where they had been just a few minutes ago and they began looking for the creature. As they scanned the riverbanks, they heard the sound of something splashing through the water a short distance away. The officers said it sounded like somebody running through knee-deep water. The four men kept up their search until the sun began coming up. Everybody was exhausted, so they called it a day. Monsters of the dark become stories in the light of day. They all began to think it had just been their nerves. Later that same day, at around 10.30 p.m., five-year-old Kristen Burial, Burrill was playing in his backyard. The house sat close to the big muddy river. Christian was trying to catch fireflies in a jar. I know what he was thinking. If you caught enough of them, it would work like a lantern. I know this because I used to try the same thing. It doesn't work. A Christian was looking around trying to spot a big bunch of flies all together to catch when he saw something by the back fence. There was some kind of a huge hair-covered thing standing on the other side of the fence. The hair was white and covered in mud. Christian was convinced he was seeing a ghost. He ran for the safety of his house, yelling, There's a huge ghost in the backyard. Right next door, Cheryl Ray and her boyfriend Randy Creeth were sitting on the back porch. As they sat there enjoying each other company, they heard a rustling sound by the back fence. As Cheryl figured it was that neighbor kid, Christian, trying to spy on them. She snuck inside to turn on the backyard lights and give the neighbor kid a surprise. Randy opened the screen door intent on scaring Christian. His father was a state trooper, and he felt this gave him some standing in the community as well. As he was moving across the yard, Cheryl turned the lights on. Standing by the back fence was a huge, hairy monster. As he stood there, transfixed, Cheryl walked out and joined him. Randy pointed out the creature, and now the young couple stood there, petrified. Randy Creeth said, The thing I remember was the bulk of it, the shape, the human form, and the stench of the river slime it apparently had on it. It was about eight feet tall and at least as stocky as a New York football player. We were within 15 feet of it, close enough to see the body, 
the texture of the fur, long and hairy like an English sheepdog. A creeth drew a sketch of the creature. The head resembled the flatwood monster. A Cheryl Ray also described the beast, which she said had inhuman features and stood more erect than an ape. As she said, it was real tall, hairy. I think it was white, but it was dirty, matted. It had a real bad odor. It was really rank. I never smelled anything like it. It seemed like an eternity we stood there, and then it just turned around and walked off into the woods. We could hear it trampling through the woods. Crete said that the animal stared at them for what felt like a long time, although he later estimated that the incident lasted only about 30 seconds. Both agreed that the creature had glowing red eyes, which Creeth accredited to glow from a distant street light. A Bigfoot is often reported as having eye shine. If you read enough reports, you'll find all colors being seen. The most common color is red. The description of the eyes is significant if one is to assume that the Murfreesboro mud monster is actually a Bigfoot-like creature that just happens to be albino. While pink eyes are a common trait in animals lacking pigmentation, Ray, unlike Creeth, would insist that the beast's eyes were actually glowing and were not reflecting light from some other source. <clears throat> After this strange interaction, the couple said the shaggy beast simply turned and pushed through the brush, thrashing its way back to the nearby river. Acreth and Ray swore the creature they saw weighed at least 350 pounds, stood at least 7 feet tall. They also stated that it had a roundish head, long gorilla-like arms. A lot of Bigfoot sightings say the head is conical shaped, that the top comes to a bit of a point. Not all witnesses say this. A few have said that the head was shaped more like a human's. Officers Nash and Manwaring were swiftly dispatched to the scene where they noticed a powerful odor that quickly dissipated. They also found a cluster of footprints where the creature had been lurking. Uh, following the officer's discovery, uh, Chief Toby Berger immediately dispatched all of his men to the scene, all 14 of them, and then he sent for an officer with a trained dog handler with the nearby Corbindale Police Department. There was a man named Jerry Nellis. Uh, Nellis was the handler of a German shepherd named Reb, who had assisted the Murfreesboro Police in the past... <clears throat> as a search and rescue dog. Reb was going to hopefully lead the officers to wherever this creature was hiding. The officers, armed with shotguns, revolvers, and a few rifles, began searching the land on the other side of the Beryl Ray fence line. Now, this was a wooded area running down to the river. The officers could make out a trail through the trees by the fresh mud on the ground. One of the officers examined the mud and discovered it was some unknown slimy substance. It looked like mud, but it had the consistency of grease. The slime smelled like dead animals. A Reb picked up on the trail and began following. As the officers followed the dog, they could see broken tree limbs and compressed brush all along the trail. The dog managed to track the monster through the dense forest and down a steep embankment towards a small pond. As the search party got farther into the woods, the underbrush got too thick for them to continue. They had to retrace their steps and try approaching the trail from a different direction. Reb picked up the trail right away. The team followed the dog who led them to a clearing. In it sat an old abandoned barn. The land belonged to a farmer named Bueller. 
As the dog approached the, dar the barn door, he seemed to lose his nerve. The dog began to whine and try to turn back. He didn't want anything to do with what was inside the barn. The officers gathered, gathered around the barn, looked at Re Reb. Then they looked at each other. If the dog was afraid of something in there, maybe they should call in some more manpower. A Chief Burger contacted other counties asking for additional men with more and bigger guns. Once it looked like they had enough firepower, the door was flung open, revealing nothing. Whatever they had been following had gone into the barn, but it was no longer there. The barn did smell like the thing had been there, but the creature had slipped away through the back of the barn and into the woods. I'll bet one or two of you is asking, why didn't they surround the barn in the first place? They may have done so. If the creature was in the barn long enough, it may have left its scent in the building. The dog would have been overpowered by the smell. Maybe the creature had left before the search party even arrived. The conversation around the barn would be nothing like the official report. Eventually, everybody went back to their normal duties. As night was following, falling once more, citizens began patrolling their neighborhoods and farms armed to the teeth. The chief of police began to worry more about one citizen shooting another. The monster soon became a lesser worry. Now, so far, nobody had been injured by the beast. The chief hoped the same could be said about the citizens' patrols. No sightings were reported, and the uproar slowly died down. Ten days after the last sighting, a traveling carnival set up in town. The Riverside Park, a few blocks from the Ray House, was turned into a lit-up attraction. The carnies had their trailers and campers set up right next to the river. The citizens had mostly convinced themselves the monster was either just folk's imagination or it had wandered away. Now it was time to enjoy themselves. At 2 a.m. July 7th, after the carnival had closed up for the night, three of the carnies, Otis Norris, Ray Adkerson, and Wesley Lavender, were sitting behind one of the carnival trucks discussing the day's activities. They were going over the receipts and making plans for the next day. They had a bunch of Shetland ponies tied up just beyond where the men were sitting. The animals began to kick at the sides of the fence and make frightened noises. The men went to see what the commotion was all about. These ponies were usually quiet and docile. The carnies looked around trying to see what was disturbing the animals. Just beyond the pony's enclosure stood an eight-foot-tall creature. The men all said it looked like it weighed about 400 pounds. The smell <clears throat> was nauseating. They turned and they ran for the trailers. Then they called the police. The monster was long gone when the authorities arrived. Their description was the same as all of the others, but none of these witnesses ever saw the thing's face. They said it was covered in hair and mud so the features couldn't be seen. <clears throat> Later that night, Nedra Green heard a commotion coming from her barn. This was followed by inhuman screams. As she elected to not investigate until after sunup. With these new sightings, the town folks began their nightly patrols once more. Chief Berger decided the thing to do was to call in some experts. In 1973, there were no Bigfoot groups you could contact. You had to ask around until somebody could put you in contact with somebody who knew somebody else. A St. Louis insurance salesman and part-time Bigfoot investigator named Harkin 
Sorkin was asked to come to Murfreesboro to either capture the creature or kill it. He arrived along with five-man team, ready to get to the bottom of the big muddy monster. The Sorkin very much wanted the monster alive. He said he had been offered two and a half million dollars for the creature if it were alive. They would brought a tranquilizer gun capable of knocking out a 500 pound beast. Now all they had to do was find it. You should always have a backup plan. The men also carried shotguns, pistols and rifles just in case. They found huge footprints and many broken branches, but no monster. Uh, during the nights on the river, they also heard weird screams coming from the thickest parts of the woods. Uh, try as they might, they never caught the monster. The story about the Murphy's Burrow mud monster were run in many of the big newspapers. Lorne Coleman did his own investigation, and he said he believed the monster was a Bigfoot-type creature with a few differences than the usual creature sightings. On January 26, 1975, four truck drivers, all traveling in separate rigs, radioed in reports of seeing a bizarre, bear-like creature near Illinois 149 Junction, west of Murfreesboro. July 7, 1975, two Murfreesboro men reported a sighting of a strange creature that they believed may have been the big muddy monster near a pond in Harrison Community, north of Murfreesboro. The witnesses all said the creature had white hair and it was covered in mud. Uh, just my theory, but a white creature would stand out in the night. By smearing itself with mud, maybe this was a form of camouflage. Uh, this would mean that the monster was far more intelligent than most people would think. I am known as being a woo or a woo-woo. <laughs> I believe Bigfoot and other cryptids come from some other dimension. They come to our world for their own reasons, and as long as we never talk to one, we'll never understand what they're doing or why. The investigators who say Bigfoot is definitely just some huge ape are missing out on a lot of evidence. Tracks that suddenly stop in the middle of a field and the creature simply vanishes. We don't know what a Bigfoot is, so we shouldn't say that we know what it isn't. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, let others know what they're missing. Tell the world to tune in and listen. If you'd like to send me a story for my next book, or you've got a show suggestion for next week or the week after, you can contact me at strange things at arcanasa.com and if you'd like to buy a t-shirt or a coffee mug or a tote bag with strange things on it you can find my merchandise at tpublic.com if you'd like to look around there you can find all kinds of cool and interesting things to buy you don't have to just look at my stuff feel free to shop until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree